Hello everyone, Peter Harris here with Commercial Property Advisors. Hope you are all doing well today. Well, I have a question for you. What does a great commercial deal look like, right? Not a, not a good one, not an average one, but a great one. What does it look like? Well, in this video, I'm going to share with you what it looks like, how you can do it, and I will give you an, a prime example uh, from a student that just closed the one. But let me share with you right now what a great, not a good, what a great commercial deal looks like. Number one, the great deal must be priced under market. Okay, I'll share with you how to find those in a second, but pay attention here. Uh, the, a great deal, number one, is priced under market. So you're getting a good deal. Number two, this great deal needs to have the ability to raise the rents. Okay, as you know, as you raise the rents, you increase the net operating income, the NOI, and the property value goes up. So when you raise the rents, you can force the appreciation. That's a great deal. Number three, you need to be in a great area, okay? Good neighborhood. If you don't have a great neighborhood, one and two wouldn't even matter, okay? So number three, great area. Number four, you need solid property management, okay? Um, we teach our students, most of them don't manage their properties. They hire third party uh, property management companies. So your property needs to be managed very well, or at least have the ability to be managed very well. Okay, so one, two, three, four. Now here's a big question. Do these deals even exist? Yes, they do, right? They do because we teach our students how to fish in a different pond. We don't play where everybody else is playing. We fish from a different pond, okay? And I will show you a prime example of that in a couple minutes, okay? with an uh, interview from one of our students that just closed this deal. Now, let me share with you what I think are the keys for you to establish these four, okay? So the first key is you need to know how to generate deals off market, okay? The deals you find on LoopNet or MLS, uh, those just aren't gonna cut it to, to achieve this here. So all of our deals, most of our deals come from uh, uh, off market, okay? Not listed anywhere, they're off market we like to go direct to the property owner, okay? Number two, you need the ability to know how to structure both conventional financing and creative financing. That is so important in generating a great deal. You need that knowledge. Number three, uh, you need to have uh, expert uh, knowledge on how to do uh, at what I call an expert analysis and also an expert on uh, extra strategies, so important. This extra strategy thing, people leave it out so much, maybe because they don't know, but after investing for 20 years and teaching our students, extra strategies set the, should be established at the beginning. It sets up the rest of this once you understand extra strategies, okay? Lastly, probably the most, the most important is get help, okay? If you're trying to do this and uh, don't do it yourself, especially if you're 40 and over, right? From me to you, you don't want to do this with a commercial deal by yourself if you're over the age of 40 because you can't afford to make a mistake, okay? This is probably going to be the largest financial investment you made in your life and you can't blow it because you probably can't recover, all right? So get help. We can probably help you with that. All right, so now what I want to do next is take you over to our short uh, student interview where our student, Stephen, accomplish that just this in about six months okay so commercial is not fast it took him six months but you just need a few of these to dramatically impact your financial life forever so let's go now to the short video then when we come back I'll wrap it up and put you in his position let's do that welcome everyone hey I have uh, a great and awesome guest and student Stephen with us this morning and uh, he closed on his first deal, and this is his story. It's amazing. Before I introduce Stephen, let me just share uh, two things great about Stephen. Number one, Stephen was uh, very coachable. He was very coachable. And number two, uh, Stephen, you took action. You know, it wasn't huge action. You just you just took constant action, right? And the result is. You're on this video. Your deal was so special. You're on this video. So everyone, let me introduce to you, Stephen Nguyen. Thanks, Stephen, for being on to this morning. Hi, Peter. Thank you. I'm very excited uh, to be here. It's, it's kind of funny. I actually stumbled across one of your YouTube videos 
you're interviewing one of the students and I just said, you know, I know I made it when I'm on this video. <laughs> so now I have the opportunity about uh, six, seven months later. So actually just very excited uh, to share my story. All right. Awesome. Well, again, thank you. Thank you. So Stephen, let's jump right into it, right? Could you share us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So I was born in a, born and raised in a typical middle-class family. You know, right now I've, I have no family, unmarried. Um, I, as my day job, I actually work as a, a pharmacy manager in a hospital. I actually moved up the, the corporate ladder pretty rapidly over the past eight years and, you know, hit my career ceiling pretty fast. But ironically, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, you know healthcare seemed as very stable. It's a stable mm -hmm. career. It's a stable profession. But actually, my hospital laid off 20% of the healthcare workers, wow. uh, myself included. Wow. So to me, wow. this was just a huge, huge wake up call to invest a lot more heavily in you know, commercial real estate and real estate in general. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. So uh, what's your reason for pursuing commercial real estate at this stage in your life? Yeah. So actually, um, I actually started investing in single family homes initially. And kind of my initial goal was to buy one single family home a year for the next 10 years and then <laughs> use that to retire, you know, leave the rat race. Um, leave my W-2 job and achieve financial freedom. Um, but actually, I stumbled, as I mentioned earlier, across one of your YouTube videos. And it just opened my eyes as to the power of commercial real estate. It helped me realize that just one deal, one deal is all it takes to achieve my cash flow goal and basically leave my day job a lot sooner uh, compared to single family. So, you know, once I kind of learned about commercial real estate, I realized that my initial goal is 10 years. I can potentially do this in you know, three to five years, you know, at this kind of current rate I'm going. So it just was very eye-opening and made me pivot 100% to commercial real estate. Got it. Got it. Great reason. And, great, and I, I know a lot of folks out there watching can really relate to that. And uh, okay, so let's jump into your deal. Okay, so uh, you're, you're on, this, on this video uh, because your deal is awesome, right? The title of this video is what a good commercial deal looks like. <laughs> And, uh, and your deal fit the picture perfectly. So share us all about your deal, how it happened. Yeah, so actually I just closed on a 26 a unit apartment complex in Oklahoma. Um, so this is an off market deal. So I was able to work directly uh, with the owner and kind of build the rapport of the owner. Um, actually, um, the, the so owner- So uh, one second, so you didn't use an agent? No, no, no agent, no broker, just me directly with the owner just me awesome. and him face you know direct communication no no middleman what's awesome um so the owner actually um preferred communication via email which was a little bit interesting at first because it's you know it's nicer to build that personal touch and rapport when you talk over the phone or in person um but he wanted everything via email um he actually was an attorney by background hmm. and to kind of cater to him because i'm all about you know Whatever works for the owner works for me. That's kind of my little healthcare uh, background, helping of that. Um, so he preferred everything written, everything documented. And how I kind of built rapport with him was I just was highly responsive and prompt. As you kind of said earlier, I took small, consistent action daily. And just knowing that I was very responsive uh, to his needs, to his questions, you know, when I ha had stuff from him, he'd give it to me pretty timely. So we just kind of built up that rapport and that connection throughout the process, because it's a long process to kind of close on a deal um, direct to owner. So that's what helped me kind of build that trust and rapport over time. Okay, great. Now, share with us about the deal, right? Um, you know, how you negotiate the deal, um, the, the upside. I mean, you're on this video because your deal is awesome. So <laughs> share us more about this deal. Yeah, so actually um, I offered uh, $520,000 for the property and that was straight off the tax record. You know, the owner, he, he basically said he wouldn't give me a price. He just said, make me an offer. So immediately I just looked on the tax record, which is, you know, public information for everybody and just offered that price. And, you know, the owner immediately accepted the offer and he said the property is as is. Like he would not make any modifications, any repairs whatsoever. I'll take it as is in present day value. So after, you know, I got the contract settled, I actually did a full on-site inspection so I flew over to Oklahoma. I met the owner there. I had my whole inspection team. We actually walked into all 26 units. Uh, it was a full eight hour day. It's a very long day. Had to you know, grab a cup of coffee, turn off my cell phone 
be free of distractions and basically go through each unit one by one. Had multiple you know, inspectors for the roof, termites, pests, electrician, plumbers, everything, the whole gamut in terms of the inspection. And, you know, I was actually pretty transparent during the whole process. You know, after I got the inspection report back, which was very comprehensive, as you can remember, had photos, details, mm-hmm. everything. It was a complete walkthrough. And, you know, I just basically got quotes for all the deferred maintenance. You know, the owner was there. So he saw what I was doing. He saw how comprehensive the inspection was. He was there the entire eight hours. He saw that I was bringing in contractors to get quotes. And after I got all the reports, I just provide him directly the exact reports I got and the exact quotes I got. Mm-hmm. I was not hiding anything. It was a fully transparent process. And kind of after, and I think initially asked for about 120 K in repair credits and, you know, he responded in the email that I was crazy. Hey, this property is as is I'm not going to do anything. He just said, but if you kind of narrow it down to items that need immediate attention, you know, I'm willing to work with you and give you some repair credits. So I just reevaluate everything, you know, definitely the roof need to be replaced. Um, a lot of like furnaces and water heaters need to be replaced. You know, there's some potholes in the driveway. So I kind of broke it down to exactly what he mentioned, what needs immediate attention. And we actually settled on about $66,000 uh, in repair credits, which, you know, I, I thought it was a huge win and uh, way more than covered all the expense I paid uh, for all those inspections. Uh, Steven, you mentioned you, you received $66,000 in credits? Yes. So I was yeah. able to get $66,000 in repair credits when wow. you initially said the properties as is. And that went directly off of your down payment, right? Yes. Yes. So, that's amazing. That's amazing. So here you are, right? You you have, number one, you have an attorney. They're hard to negotiate with. They're pretty stern, right? And they can be intimidating at, at, at times. And here's a guy that says up front, um, you know, as is, take it or leave it. It's yours. If you don't want it, I'll keep it, right? And then, so how did you get him to soften up to go from zero to $66,000 in, in uh, closing credits? How'd you do that? You know, I, I think it was just building trust and rapport. As I mentioned, this was like a two month process and I, I just include him throughout the entire process. Like, like I mentioned, he, he was there during the inspection and he's owned the property for about 13 years. So he probably mm-hmm. knew that um, you know, there's a lot of deferred maintenance and I made it not about what I said. It's about what these third party inspectors said and what the contractor said. So it's not me versus you. It's this is what this third party is saying. Let's solve this problem together. Because, you know, he wouldn't help me close on the deal. Then he knew that he had to take care of these uh, deferred maintenance layer down the road. Mm. So, mm. you know, make it, it makes it a little more swallowable when, you know, at the close of escrow, I just get repair credit. It's, you know, he's getting paid for the price of the apartment and he just to give me back a little bit for credit. So I think overall, it's just kind of building that trust over time. Yeah. And it's really involving in the process. Um, like I said, I was completely 100% transparent. I wasn't hiding anything. Anytime I had pushback, I just would get a third party opinion. Like initially when he shot down my 120 K, you know, uh, uh, repair request, I just said, let me touch base with my property manager and let's just see what needs immediate attention. And then I basically gave him a big breakdown on the email. The email was about almost two pages. It was like an essay. Mm-hmm. After reading that, he just immediately signed it right after. So I think he, they just want to know that you're not trying to, you know, you know, cheat them too much, you know, sure. negotiations win, win. It's not, I don't want the other party to feel like they got fleeced or the short end of the stick. I want to sure. make it a win situation. Sure. So I think just having that approach and that mindset, uh, luckily I kind of built that from healthcare, um, just really made it seamless. Like, I think he just knew that I wasn't trying to pull a fast one on him. Great, I just wanted great. what's best for him. No, that's, so. that, that is so great. Now, you know, one of the things that, you know, we stress when, when we're training you is, is uh, to get the seller motivation, right? Direct motivation. So in this case, uh, what was his motivation for selling? He actually self-managed, did his own maintenance, did his own pest control. And he also bought the property himself because he's actually a a licensed broker as well. Mm. This owner, he he did everything himself. And for him, it was a job. Mm. So he was at the age where between his law practice and this, you know, he was, you know, obviously very busy and he just wanted to retire. He was at that retirement age. And this was kind of his nest egg, his retirement plan that he's been working on for the past 13 you know, to 15 years. And he just kind of wanted to reap the benefits and 
kind of ease off his life. Yeah, that's great. So you caught him at a at the perfect time in his life, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right time, right place. That's right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that's right. You know, we always say when a willing uh, buyer and a willing seller get together, wonderful things can happen. And and here we are. Okay. Now share uh, a little bit about the upside in the property. So I actually had traditional financing on this property. I, I did 20% down, got about 4.2 interest, uh, amortized over 30 years, and actually found that using a mortgage broker. Ironically, when the bank did the property and or the appraisal, the property actually appraised at 750K. Wow. So, right so you, bought it, you, you bought it for 520 and it appraised for 750? Yes. I got it at 520, got 66K in credit and it appraised at 750K. So just okay. day one, that's almost, you know, 200 and what, 90K yes. of equity built in, you know, day one. Day one. That's amazing. That's amazing. And this is why we like to go direct to the property owner because there's no way an agent would have sold a property at that level, right? Yeah. So that's why we always stress to everyone out there, everyone listening is, you know, we fish in a, in a different pond from everyone else. And you're, you're the result of that. Yeah. That is yeah. awesome. That is awesome. So we have, uh, so not only do you have upside and equity day one, what about day two rent increases to increase the property value more? Do you have, can you increase the rent? The owner, um, you know, he really didn't raise rents much uh, for most of the tenants. Uh, you know, I believe a lot of tenants were there, you know, four years plus, and mm. he never really, like I mentioned, he self-managed himself and he drafted his own lease agreements and whatnot. And he really didn't you know, raise the rents that much. So kind of the average rent was about 450 to 500. Hmm. But, you know, after talking with my property manager, um, who's actually helping me with the renovation, we believe we can probably average about $6,000 per unit and then raise the rents about, you know, 50 to 150 uh, per unit conservatively, wow. uh, depending on the one bedroom versus two bedroom. Um, so we think there's huge upside. And, you know, after we're done with the, the turns and the renovation plan and raising the rents, you know, we think we can at least double the value of what I purchased it at uh, being conservative. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Now here you are in California, this property is in Oklahoma, right? And, uh, you know, tell us about this proper manager that you have. Uh, it, by the way, you know, he's a proper manager that I use. And uh, <laughs> so I, so I know he's awesome, but, uh, but, but you have to share with us, you know, you as a beginner being coached by us, how are you going to manage the property from California knowing for that it's in Oklahoma. So share with us about the property manager and the process. Yeah. So as you mentioned, I was very fortunate that uh, you could refer me, you know, amazing property manager, you know, that they have a lot of experience in managing multifamily apartment complexes. They're very good at renovations. They're very cost effective in terms of how much do I need to spend to maximize my rent value. So they just have a very strong pulse on the market and they actually are very hands-on. Uh, they actually were working in, in my apartment complex uh, directly <laughs> this actually past weekend um, to kind of, you know, show the tenants they were there. But yeah, what's fortunate about having a great property manager is, you know, I'm in California, they're my boots on the ground. So obviously they're going to be the ones to tell me, you know, what needs to be done to make an apartment, you know, clean for Oklahoma standards. You know, obviously I'm from California, so it's different here versus in Oklahoma. So they gave me that kind of real world practical um, sense of what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And for me, I just, you know, create a system, you know, to meet with the property managers once a month. So we, we have, you know, monthly reports that they automate um, through rent manager. And from there, I'll kind of review those reports and then meet with them monthly to discuss the plan. So, you know, obviously I have to do a lot of renovation to do the value add investment. So just kind of meeting with them to say, okay, like, what do we need to do for these two vacant units um, to raise the rents? And then once tenants start to turn, because I imagine as uh, we go through the apartment complex, there's going to be some turnover, uh, getting maybe getting rid of some tenants that, you know, maybe don't fit what we want. And there'll be some turns and just having that plan in place to renovate those units as fast as possible to then um, rent them out um, to clientele that would, you know, pay those higher market rents. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Now, um, uh, quick change of subject, you know, uh, some of the, maybe some of the audience is wondering you know, you mentioned the rents are low, so maybe it's a bad area, right? So, uh, and by the way, we wouldn't have you buying a bad area. So, so share something about this area, right? Yeah. So, uh, ironically, when we did the Google Street View, it did not look that 
good of a property. <laughs> I remember we both did the Google Street View. It did not look very, you know, good from that view. But when I actually flew there, the first thing I noticed when I drove in was it was a lot better than I expected in person. Mm. You know, despite it being kind of a C-class neighborhood, a lot of, you know, work, you know, work class uh, renters and tenants. But what really surprised me uh, about the property was there was no trash anywhere. Mm. Like during the onsite inspection, I actually left my Starbucks uh, on the staircase by accident. And I walked into a unit. When every time I walked out, someone was grabbing my Starbucks cup and throwing it in the trash can. <laughs> okay. Wow. So I actually was ironically the messy one, but it just showed me that, you know, these tenants, they, they really cared about the property yeah. and it's kind of pride yeah. of ownership. Yeah. You know, so that, that was really, you know, impressive to me. And, you know, just driving around the area, um, I drove there during the daytime at nighttime to get a sense of, you know, the area. And this was very quiet. No one was loitering around. It was actually surrounded by a lot of single family homes. So it was actually a very, very, you know, nice pocket, you know, and I would have not known that had I not flown, you know, to Oklahoma and saw it myself because uh, Google Street View did not do it justice. Yes, I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, because yeah. I was surprised. I go, look, you know, the, the price is low. OK, maybe it's in a tough neighborhood. And then you and I Googled it on our coaching call. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And then I had reservations. And then once you flow out there and you send back the report, that OK, he's there. He approves of it. Yeah. So let's uh, keep marching forward. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually ready to, you know, get rid of this deal, but I remember you kept on pushing me with the numbers. So I just yeah. said, you know what, let me just give it a shot. <laughs> Worst case it, um, I just say no. Yeah. And uh, back at my current baseline. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, uh, uh let's see, Stephen, can you share with us, uh, you know, most of our audience are beginners who just want to get started. Can you share just a couple things, uh, maybe encouraging things or some tips on how they can get started, how, how, how they can become or do what you just did? Yeah. So as we kind of alluded at the beginning of the video, it's just taking small, consistent daily action. Mm -hmm. You know, initially it doesn't seem like much, but once you kind of compound that over, you know, six or seven months, you know, you can see massive results. It's just kind of like uh, that hockey stick effect. At first, it kind of starts off flat and all of a sudden it just kind of skyrockets. Yeah. I feel like I'm just right at that inflection point. And it was just due to my small, consistent action. You know, it can seem intimidating to, and even myself, I was very intimidated uh, by apartment complexes. If, if you asked me, you know, a year ago, hey, what do you think about owning an apartment complex in Oklahoma? I'd say, you're crazy. <laughs> you know, I can barely do a single family home here in, in California where I'm based. But just taking that, if you kind of break down that big problem into small little problems, like, yeah. you know, hey, I have this one issue today. Okay, okay, what's the lending like? How do I run the numbers on this property? How can I find a property manager? Uh, what calls do I need to make? Um, how do I reach out to many different lenders? You know, so I just always had that approach of no didn't mean stop. It just meant ask someone else. So yeah. one lender told me no, ask a different lender. That yeah. lender said me no, ask a mortgage broker. Yeah. So it's just never taking no for an answer and just taking that small daily consistent action and just never giving up. If you kind of have that mentality, uh, you'll eventually land a deal, maybe similar to mine. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. No, thanks for sharing that. Okay. And uh, let, let's close with this. So um, what does the future look like for you? you know, what are some of your commercial estate investing plans? What do you, what do you plan on doing moving forward? Yeah, so actually, um, I'm actually a buy and hold investor. So kind of my exit strategy for all my you know, commercial real estate is, you know, buy it, add value, and then cash out refinance within, you know, three to five years, depending on how fast I can go. And kind of my mentality for that is, as you know, it's a lot of work to find a deal, to stabilize a deal, renovate the apartment complex, and then cash out refinance. So once you did all that initial heavy lifting, after that, you kind of like just need to, you kind of cruise for lack of a better word. Mm. And I want to kind of reap the fruits of my labor. You know, this sure. has been a long, hard two months. It's rewarding, but now I just want to reap the benefits of this apartment complex. Once it's, you know, the rents are raised, it's renovated and it's just stabilized. But what I hope to do is after I cash out refinance, I want to pull out all my initial equity and then use it to buy more mm. um, uh, commercial real estate. So actually I'm kind of focused on, uh, what you call the, the four recession resistant assets. Mm -hmm. So number one is apartment complex. Uh, number two is mobile home parks. You know, people always need a place to live. So that's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And people need 
Um, low income housing, you know, it's a bigger yep. need now more than ever. Yep. Uh, number two, but number three is a self storage. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of stuff that they need to store, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so there's always a need for that. And then lastly, industrial. Yeah. Um, you know, e-commerce is a booming business, yep. you know, COVID definitely expedited that. So, you know, people need a place to store inventory. And then, um, actually I have, um, one, uh, office building in the pipeline, actually, um, that's actually three miles away from my apartment complex. Mm. And, you know, I'm trying to, you know, do due diligence on this office building right now to see if it's a good fit, but it's just kind of nice how it's only three miles away. So I'm trying to see if you know, I can use my current property managers, maybe I have to find one that specializes in leases. And I just know the area very well. Cause I, during my time there, I, you know, explored all of Oklahoma essentially in my yeah. car. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of hoping to do more deals. Um, for this first deal, I actually self-funded it myself. And that's kind of the reason for that was I kind of want to prove to myself that I could do this deal by myself. Yeah. But later down the road, I'm hoping, and you're kind of helping me with that, is I want to start syndicating deals yes. and getting other investors involved. But before doing that, I just kind of want to prove to myself that I can find a good deal. I can negotiate a good deal and I can manage a good deal and execute my exit strategy plan. So it becomes an easier pitch that, you know, I don't need to sell you on my deal. The deal will just sell itself. Yeah. So that's kind of my, my approach. I'm unfortunately not the greatest salesman, um, <laughs> but I just kind of want the deal to speak for itself Yeah. and that they have confidence that I can manage and find these good deals. Yeah. A- so. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. And we're here to help you here to help you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So, Stephen, uh, this morning has been wonderful. So uh, thank you for sharing everything about yourself and this deal. And I'm sure it has uh, encouraged many people out there. So, again, I appreciate you very much. And uh, we'll be talking next week. Yeah, no, I, I hope to be back with a second video. You know, all right, I'm, okay. I'm competitive. Uh, so uh, <laughs> hopefully I can be back for a second video. With, uh, all right. Let's with plan here. on that. Hello everyone, welcome back. Now, isn't Steven incredible? He is, right? Incredible young man. Nothing but success is going to happen to this young man at his pace, okay? Now, let me just do a quick recap because as I promised, I want to put you uh, exactly in his place so you can do exactly what he he did. And this is what our company does, okay? All right, so number one, uh, uh, let me recap the deal. So 26 units in Oklahoma. Uh, he, uh, the, the contract price was $520,000 and then uh, upon the appraisal, it appraised for $750,000, right? So he walked in with uh, over $200,000 equity day one, day one, right? And then, uh, and let me skip to number four, he also negotiated $66,000 of closing credits at closing that came off of his down payment, right? So basically, you can maybe add the sixty-six thousand dollars to this, and he came away, come away with uh, you know two hundred eighty thousand dollars equity day one. Incredible, incredible. But uh, that's what a good de- a commercial deal looks like. Okay, so he followed all the steps, right? Okay. Now, probably the most important thing, and uh, I want to talk about this because this was St- Stephen Stephen's goal when he originally came to us. He uh, dabbled in single family homes. It was taking him nowhere fast. And he said, Peter, I want to do multifamily. So this is why we teach our students multifamily, okay? So the rents can go up. They can be increased to $150 per unit. And he has 26 units, right? So do the math, uh, $150 per unit per month times 26 units, okay? Times 12 months, that's about an extra $46,800 per year. Okay, to his bottom line. It's incredible. Yes, it's going to take him two and a half years, but that's okay, right? All right, so additional $46,800 on his bottom line on his NOI, right? Now, he's in a seven cap market. It's not a super expensive market. It's not a very poor market. He's middle range, so about a seven cap market. So if I, if I divide this $46,800 by, by 7%, by seven cap, uh, it comes out to be... A, a forced appreciation over two and a half years of six hundred and sixty-eight thousand dollars. Okay, so it's only going to take Stephen a few of these deals again to 
dramatically impact uh, his financial life forever. And, and when he has kids, forever. Okay? Now, okay, enough about the deal. Now, let's talk about Stephen himself, right? So, uh, not only did Stephen, uh, you know, find a and execute a what a great commercial deal is, he was a great person himself, as you can tell from this video, right? And he was, to me, he was very coachable, very coachable. Number two, he took action. Uh, he didn't take like huge action. He just did exactly what we wanted him to do, but he did it consistently, okay, over time. It took him uh, a half a year to get this deal. Okay, so commercial's not quick, but in six months, look what he accomplished, okay? Now, many of you know, my mom is Japanese, so my mom taught us this. It's called Kaizen, right? So, uh, so we, we were very studious. He's Japanese, right? So what we did was Kaizen means continuous improvement over a long period. So that taught us patience, right? And that's exactly uh, what, what Stephen did. He had a Kaizen principle in him. Uh, so he he just took what we what we taught him and just did it consistently month over month over month over month. Look at the results. Okay, number three, he was I thought he did this very well. I mean, he was able to negotiate uh, sixty six thousand dollars in credit from a seller who was an attorney. And how many of you you all know that negotiating with attorneys very difficult, very difficult. Okay, and uh, but uh, Stephen he honored the relationship. He was transparent with the seller who was an attorney, and look at the result here. Okay, so uh, so I always preach that this business of commercial estate is a relationship-based business. There's proof. Okay, all right. Number four, Stephen has a good property manager. He has my property manager, right? And uh, he has a good property manager, which makes his business scalable, right? We always teach our students that when you find a good property manager, because Let's face it, nine out of 10 are not any good, okay? When you find a good property manager, stick with that person and build your business around that person or that person's company. That's what Stephen's gonna do, and that's what he's doing currently, okay? Now, number five, now that uh, Stephen has systems in place, uh, after uh, our student closed the deal, we meet with them every month to establish the systems so they can build their business. So now that he has this in place, he can go for his next deal, right? Don't just buy a property and think you can just buy another one. You have to put the systems in place to make sure it's operated correctly. Okay? And now Stephen's goal is he wants to his goal is to do syndication. I have a feeling that Stephen's investors will be very, very happy with their returns at the rate he's going. Alright? Okay everyone, so I hope you enjoyed this video. Now you understand what a great commercial deal looks like. Not a good one but a great one. So thank you, Stephen. And hey, everyone out there, could you just say congratulations to Stephen? Just give him a high five and tell him great job. Tell him great job. All right. Thanks, everyone. If you want more videos like this, go ahead and like this video. Go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you so much, everyone, and I'll see you at the next video.